We're going to be reading out of 1 Samuel chapter 13, and we're going to read verses 16 all the way through chapter 14, verse 21. So a good little bit of reading to kind of set the context. This is an Old Testament passage of Scripture. Uh, 1 Samuel was written by the prophet Samuel, a prophet slash uh, priest of God. Amen. And um, Samuel was during the time frame of the anointing of King David, but also during the time frame of King Saul, Saul's reign over Israel. Now, I'm going to set the context for you because every single message that I preach out of the Old Testament is going to reveal Jesus in the New Testament. Because see, this, the God that we serve is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He doesn't change. And His Word doesn't change. And what He desires to communicate to mankind is to understand that He has a plan. And the plan was to send Jesus. Amen. To redeem us. What does that mean? To purchase us back from the slavery of our sin. See, that's really the problem with mankind. You may not hear that all the time at the church down the road or a church. But, but what I want you to know is, is that really and truly the problem with man is sin. Amen. It's not that we don't know how to balance our checkbook. It's not that we don't know how to properly uh, engage in a relationship. It's not that we don't have good work ethic. No, all of those things are just symptom of the problem called sin. Sin steals our desire to get up and to do the right thing. Sin steals our desire to humble ourselves in, in, in the midst of a relationship. Sin steals our desire to humble ourselves under authority that God has placed, whether it be a boss, whether it be the police department, whatever the case. I'm just here to communicate the truth of the gospel to you. Had sin not entered into the world, we wouldn't have the problems that we have on the earth today. But good news, good news. God the Father sent His Son Jesus. He wrote a prescription. Hallelujah. And if you and I will take our medicine, He will heal us. If we will receive Christ Jesus the Lord, not just one time, every day. This is like you got to get up every morning you got to take your medicine. What are you talking about? Put your faith in Christ. Put your faith in the Lord and understand that He went before you and He humbled Himself and He did the Father's will. And in the same way, it says, the Word of God says that Jesus be conformed into the image of your Savior. What does conform mean? It means to be molded. It means that God wants you and I to be like clay in the potter's hand. He wants to have His way in our hearts and in our lives. He wants to be able to form us. Amen. And you and I got to work together with the Lord. We have to cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. And we got to surrender our own will unto the Father. We had a men's meeting last night. And that was one of the things that the Lord revealed to me. And it's nothing that you probably haven't heard before. But, you know, one of the we have to cooperate. We have to surrender to the will of God. Amen. And many times our flesh doesn't want to do that. Can I just be real with you this yeah. morning? It's okay if I, if I just talk straight with you. We call it straight talk church this morning, all right? That many, see, you need to understand something before I even get started in this story. That Jesus has already done it. I'm here to tell you and remind you again in case you already knew. But, you, but maybe it's slipping your mind. Jesus has already won the battle. Jesus has already won the war. Hallelujah. The word of God says in the book of Ephesians that you and I are seated in him already in heavenly places. In the mind of the father it's a done deal. You're in Christ and Christ is seated at the right hand of the father. Hallelujah. The victory is secure. The problem that we have is the sin problem. Still, even if you're saved, sin still will try to make you go in an opposite direction of the Father's will. Um, yes. And so what we have is a surrender problem. And so what we need is for the Lord to move upon our hearts with grace that we would surrender to His will. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Listen, I, moved, I, I titled this morning's message, Move Towards Victory. All right, so let's go ahead and start reading in this passage of Scripture. It says, And Saul and Jonathan his son and the people that were present with them abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And the spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned unto the way that leads to Ophrah, unto the land of Shual, and another company turned the way to Beth Horon, and another company turned to the way of the border that looked to the valley of Zeboam toward the wilderness. 
Now there was no smith found throughout the land. Now, in other words, there was no uh, wor uh, worker of irons or metals. You know, a, 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 a silversmith or some type of a smith, a person that works with metal, because he's talking about to create weaponry for the people. All right, of Israel for the Philistines said. If the Hebrews make them swords or spears, so they didn't allow any smiths. So what I want you to get a picture right here is that the Philistines, which is God's people's enemy, is in, it has control over God's people right here. So in a spiritual sense, you could say that this is a type of when the enemy of your soul, the devil, has you in some form of bondage or control because of a spiritual stronghold in your life. The Philistines, God's enemies in this Old Testament passage, because the story is always the same in the Bible. There's a struggle going on with bondage, then physically, now spiritually, whatever it is, pick your poison. What is the Philistine in your life? I'm just saying, you, I, you don't need to come up and talk to me. I mean, you can if you want to. I'll pray with you. Praise God. But what I'm saying is, is right now, what is the Philistine in your life that holds you in control, that tries to keep you from God's will? And so they, they wouldn't even let them have swords. They didn't have swords. They didn't have spears. But look what it says in verse 20. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, his coulter, his axe and his mattock. We're talking about plowing instruments now. It's using old English words, but we're talking about plowshares. We're talking about pickaxes. We're talking about other kinds of axes. Okay. And they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes and for the to sharpen the goads. I even mentioned that last night. A goad was like a sharpened instrument that had a point on the end of it that they used to try to drive cattle to go in the right direction. Nowadays, I remember my uncle one time had an electric prod and they were hitting them cows trying to make them new. But back in the day, they just had a sharp stick with a pointy end on it and they'd stick them in the hindquarters to make them go in the right direction. So that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about farm implementations that's being used for weaponry because they didn't have... The, anything in their hands to use to have strength. And I got to tell you something, spiritually speaking, you can't fight the power of right. sin in your own strength. Right. Right. You're, you're not going to be able to muster up enough strength. You're not going to be able to get up enough willpower in order to accomplish the victory that you desire to see in your life. It's going to be a work of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. It says, so it came to pass in the day of the battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and Jonathan, his son, there was found. In other words, Saul and Jonathan were the only ones that had weapons. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. Now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor. So that's his armor bearer. It's really what a lot of this story is about, the armor bearer. What does that mean? It means that Jonathan was a leader in the military and that he had a protege or a sidekick, if you will. Well, I mean, if we could be, hopefully you don't think I'm being silly, kind of like Batman and Robin. So you got Batman, he's got Robin as his sidekick. You got Jonathan, his armor bearer. But this was a common finding. An armor bearer would help to carry the armor for the warrior. All right. And so Jonathan says to his armor bearer, he says, come and let us go over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side. But he didn't tell his father about this. And look what it says. And Saul tarried. That word tarried means to wait. Saul waited in the uttermost part of Gibeah. And where was he? He was under a pomegranate tree. So he's enjoying the shade. And he's just kind of sitting down resting. Which is in Migron. And the people that were with him was about 600 men. And Ahiah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing the ephod. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. And between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock. I find this interesting. See, when I read the Bible now, and I'm reading through, I try, you know, it's, you got to be careful because sometimes the, the enemy will try to make you go to sleep when you're reading stuff you don't always understand, right? But one thing I'll tell you is this, is that when you're reading the Word of God and you see all of a sudden something that seems to, why is that even there? To me, it means that God wants us to see it for some reason. For some reason, God wants us to see that the way that Jonathan took was between a sharp rock. And then not only that, does he want us to see it, it was named. And God wants us to be aware that this rock that was sharp on both edges had a name actually on either side. One of the names was Bozes, 
And the other name of the other side of the rock was Sinah. The forefront of the one was situated northward over against Michmash, and the other southward against Gibeah. And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come and let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. Now, many of you that have been coming to the church for any length of time already understand that really what that word uncircumcised means in the Old Testament is it describes people that weren't in covenant with God. We don't need to get all graphic on it, but that's important to understand. See, whenever young David, the, kid, the, the boy, the shepherd boy, walked into the camp that day when Goliath was screaming. You remember the story of David and Goliath, the big giant? And Goliath was over there and he was breathing threats to the military of Israel. And Israel was scared and nobody wanted to go fight the giant. And David said, how can you let this uncircumcised Philistine talk this way about our God? Because what he was saying is, is that what he's saying is, is that he's uncircumcised. He's not in covenant with our God. Don't you know the God that we serve? Don't you know how powerful he is? Don't you know what he can do in your life and in my life? And don't you know that that giant needs to fall before him because you and I are in agreement with God? Amen. Now, i got to tell you Amen. something. In the Old Testament, that uncircumcision or circumcision is descriptive of whether or not you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. Have you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior this morning? Because if you are saved, I'm here to tell you what the Word of God says. The Word of God says that a circumcision of the heart has been performed in your life. Amen. See, whenever you, Jesus died on the cross and then you put faith in Jesus... Guess what happened? The old man that you were in the mind of God died with Jesus at Calvary. Right. The old man that you were that was born in Adam. Don't you realize that that's why you got the problem that you have? Yeah. In your physical birth, you were born like Adam. And in your spiritual DNA, you have a desire to go towards things that are contrary to God's will. But hallelujah, on the day that you heard the gospel, whether you knew it or not, when you believe by faith in Jesus, the one who died for your sin, in the mind of the Father, the old man born of Adam died in Christ, was buried with him, and a new man has been resurrected to newness of life. And if you and I will just daily surrender to the Lord's will instead of our own will, we will see ourselves looking more and more like Jesus Hallelujah. each and every day. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So there's a circumcision of the heart that's taking place. God wants to do a spiritual surgery on our hearts. Amen? Amen. He said, it may be that the Lord will work for us. So now what we have is we have Jonathan and his armor bearer, and they're going after these uncircumcised Philistines, these people that are not in covenant. Basically what he's saying is they ain't got power over us. The enemy of the Lord doesn't have power over you because you're not the uncircumcised. If you're saved this morning, you are the child of the living God. Amen. Amen. He says the Lord may work for us. There is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. In other words, the Lord's arm isn't short. In other words, God has power. Amen. It doesn't matter if it's one guy that he's using, two guys that he's using. Hallelujah. The, the battle is the Lord's. Yes. The Lord's going to win the battle. Not you, not me. It doesn't matter how bad the odds look. It doesn't Listen, it doesn't matter how deep your situation appears. It doesn't mean, matter how bad the situation that you're facing looks. It doesn't matter how insurmountable it seems. No matter how far you've gone in the wrong direction, I'm here to tell you that the, the, the arm of the Lord isn't short. He can accomplish what he says he can do. But the question is, will we believe him in the midst of the trial or will we continue to give in to or to stay stagnant with where we are and be happy with, with just settling for second best? Verse 7, And his armor bearer said unto him, Do all that is in your heart. Turn. Behold, I am with you according to your heart. In other words, his armor bearer saying, listen, man, I'm going to go with you every step of the way. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to trust. I'm going to fight with you. I'm going to fight side by side with you. Wouldn't it be good if we had some people in the church that felt that way? Yes. Yeah. Lord, help us. You know, we're all at different levels in our walk with the Lord. Right. We're all saved the same amount. But, we might, but some of us might understand a little bit more about the word. Some of us might have walked this journey a little longer. Some of us might be a little bit more mature than others in the Lord. Okay? And, 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 and we need to understand that. 
but one of the things that you got to understand is this, is that you're not alone. You're not supposed to be alone. And if you are so busy in your life and you've been saved for a period of time that you can't stop long enough to try to help a brother or a sister out, try to give them a hand to help pick them up a little bit, then you're kind of like on the wrong path. You're, something's not right. Your heart, your heart's not right because people need help. Exactly. People need an armor bearer. Somebody's going to stand in agreement with them and walk with them towards the right way, towards victory. Move towards victory is the message this morning. Yes. Then said Jonathan, behold, we will pass over unto these men and we will discover or reveal ourselves unto them. And if they say unto us, tarry or wait there until we come to you, then we will not, we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say this, come up unto us, then we will go up for the Lord has delivered them into our hand. And this shall be a sign unto us. You know, a lot of times none of this is in my notes. I'm just going as we're going. I feel like the Lord's saying little things to me. You know, a lot of times we have an idea of where the direction that the Lord would have us to go. A, a main direction in our lives. Like, for instance, Jonathan knew that the Lord wanted him to go fight these Philistines. But we don't necessarily always know exactly how the Lord's going to do it. So we're, he's moving in the right direction. But what he's saying is, OK, Lord, if these guys tell us to wait right here. Then, I mean, I don't know what his reasoning was. I would imagine, though, you know, whenever I played football, I can remember I tried to stand still one time and hit somebody that was running full blast. Don't ever do that. That was dumb because that guy just mowed right over me. But what I learned from that lesson was next time I'm going to be the guy with the head of steam. And whenever I'm heading in the right direction, he going to be the one on his back. I don't know if that was the thing, you know, but that's basically what was happening. You wait there until we come to you. Or if they tell us to come to them, the Lord is with us. The point that I'm trying to make to you is this, is that God has a direction for you to go. He's already shown you things in your heart and your life of directions where you're going that are wrong directions. And the question is, will you trust him? But I don't even know what to trust him for, preacher. Just start heading in the right direction and pray to the Lord and say, all right, Lord, show me something as I head in the right direction and you will give me wisdom and guidance. Hallelujah. Whether I turn left, turn right, wherever I'm going, but help me to head in the right direction. Amen. Amen. And it says, and both of them revealed themselves unto the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes where they had hid themselves. You know what they're basically, they're, they're trash talking. Oh, look at them. They come out of the holes in the caves because I didn't read the whole story to you. In the first part of chapter 13, it says that the people followed Saul trembling. They were caught up in fear and they hid themselves in caves and in dens. So they were, they were fearful and here's their leader sitting under a pomegranate tree and he's just sitting back acting like everything's okay. And the reality of it is, is that the people are scared to fight and the people are willing to be oppressed by their enemy. They can't even own a firearm anymore. I mean, if we were going to bring it into modern day society, the, the, the enemy of God's people say, you, you can't Second Amendment right? You, you ain't got a Second Amendment right. You can't own a firearm anymore. You can't have no weapons to protect yourself. And so here they are sitting back in fear and unable to move. And look, the Philistines are clowning them. Oh, look, they came out the cave. Look at them. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, there it is right there. The Lord just gave us the sign. He says, come up after me for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. Follow me, armor bearer, because the Lord has delivered those Philistines, that enemy, into our hands. We have strength. God is with us. And today is the day that we're going to move towards victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Jonathan climbed upon his hands and upon his feet and his armor bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan. And his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men. Within, as it were, a half acre of land which a yoke of oxen might plow. And there was trembling in the host in the field. What that means is now Israel that was hiding isn't the one trembling, but the enemy's trembling. The host means the, the military. And among all the people, the garrison and the spoilers, they also trembled. And the earth quaked. And so it was a very great trembling. 
And the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away, and they went on beating down one another. Then said Saul unto the people that were with him, Number now and see who has gone from us, because he knew he could hear that there was a skirmish taking place, and he's sitting up under the tree, and he's like, Who's missing? There's a war that's going on. Behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said unto Ahiah, bring here the ark of God. For the ark of God was at that time with the children of Israel. And it came to pass why Saul talked unto the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. They, I mean, it got worse. The battle got worse for the Philistines. And they started like making more and more noise. I don't know what they were doing. I don't know if they were wailing or they were howling or what kind of noise they were making, but they were getting beat down and, and, and you could hear that it was getting worse. Saul said unto the priest, withdraw your hand. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves and they came to the battle. Look at this. They got them to move. They saw some victory taking place. It stirred them up in their heart. It gave them some motivation to begin to move in the right direction. Look at this. Behold, every man's sword was against his fellow. You know what that means? Talking about the Philistines. It describes the fact that whenever Jonathan and his armor bearer were willing to move in the right direction and follow after God, that God actually took over the battle and caused confusion in the enemy's camp to where they took their own weapons and turned it upon themselves. What I'm here to tell you that in the spiritual, what that means for you in the New Testament, you Christian that sits in the church, the battle again is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. Hallelujah. And if you're willing to put him in it, he will get it done for you. And and he can cause confusion in the enemy's camp. And he will begin to bring freedom in your life. Hallelujah. He says, moreover, the Hebrews, look at this. You can, don't miss this. Moreover, the Hebrews, who are the Hebrews? That's the children of Israel. That's God's people. Amen. That were with the Philistines. So you know what that means? That means that there were some, some of God's people that whenever the Philistines were holding God's people in bondage, you know what they said? They said, well, it ain't too cool to be a Hebrew no more. I think I'm going to go over here and be a Philistine. You know, what does that mean? That means the Christian that in modern day would say, I don't know, I kind of like the way the world's handling it. The world seems stronger than the church. I'm going to walk away and I'm going to start hanging out with the world. I'm going to walk away from, from God. I'm going to walk away from Jesus. I'm going to start rubbing shoulders with the world. I like the way the world does things more than the way that the church does things. Lord, help us. But when they saw the victory, see, I can remember one time I would, Aaron and I, I told this story before, but there's a lot of different elements to this story that I still remember. We went to Bourbon Street with this guy named Lance Rao carrying a cross. It was the most amazing, I was so on fire for the Lord when we were going to hand out tracts and tell people about Jesus. I don't know what you think about that, but, I, but that's not neither here nor there. I'm just telling you, it was probably one of the most profound moments of my Christian life. And... When we went out there, like the closer we got to Bourbon Street, is like the music was was boom, 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 and it was and it you could feel like you were entering into the enemy's territory. I mean, so to speak. Don't don't you know? Look, we all been to Bourbon Street for reasons that we weren't supposed to go there, but Hallelujah for a time that I went to Bourbon Street for the right purpose. So the closer we got, the more the battle felt like it was about to happen. But we were following after this guy that was following after Christ. I'm telling you right now, this dude was a complete radical for Jesus. I mean, when we got out of his vehicle, he took one of those horns, those ram horns called a shofar. He poured some olive oil in it and it went, boop, boop. And then I mean, it just flew all up in the air and sprayed all over the place. He's like, okay, soldiers, let's go. And he starts carrying that cross. And then when he got in the middle of Berber Street, I mean, there was just people everywhere. He just planted that big old cross in the middle of it. And he started telling people about Jesus. But one of the things that really, that I'll never forget was all of the, People that had been saved yes. that were walking now with drinks in their hands and they were living just like the world. You call it what you want, church. Mm -hmm. Even if you're going to sit here, you're going to try to tell me that it's okay for Christians to drink and I'm done arguing that point. Okay, mm -hmm. because anything that's got a spirit behind it that addicts you to it to where you become a slave to it. It ain't of the Lord, brothers and sisters. But that's another story for another time. I can guarantee you it's not God's will for you to be on Bourbon Street in the midst of the sludge and the smut and the sin and the garbage carrying on, rubbing shoulders with them and not taking a stand.
and in being separate from, hallelujah, the world system. Because the word of God has always declared that his people must come out from amongst them and be separate, says the Lord. What fellowship does light have with darkness? No, this is the truth. And we're going to speak the truth of God's word. But I got to tell you something. As that man stood there and just kept telling people about Jesus, I can't tell you about how many people turned around and said, thank you, dude. Thank you. When I was 13, I gave my heart to Jesus. I used to go to youth group and I lived for the Lord till I was 18. And then when I went to college, I started drinking and I started and, and I haven't been able to find my way back. But whenever I saw you doing this, the Lord smote my heart. And he would say, right now, brother, <laughs> bow your knee right now in this, on this dirty road and you can make things right with Jesus. Some of them did. Some of them did, but what I'm trying to say is this, is that in this story right here, some of these Hebrews had gone over to the other side. Some of these people had walked away from the Lord because it looked like the world had something to offer them. And they were just stuck in a rut, just like the rest of the children of Israel hiding in caves. But hallelujah, when somebody heard the voice of the Lord and was willing to walk towards victory, was willing to move in the right direction and to trust God. And when God began to give that person a little bit of victory, see, when I saw this man walking towards Bourbon Street with a little moving towards victory, it encouraged me. It filled my spirit up with encouragement. Hallelujah. By the, the next thing you know, dude, I'm like, I, I'm right there with him. I'm like, hey, man, Jesus loves you. Jesus died to set you free. I can remember this one dude walked up to me and he slapped me and, and he said, when are you going to come over to the devil's side? And I can just remember thinking, but he ran away you know you know but i was like oh thank you jesus i just got slapped for the lord man hallelujah you know people were spitting on that dude and he was just keeping on loving him i don't know you can think what you want but i'm telling you right now it was one of the most beautiful things i've ever experienced in my life hallelujah thank you jesus to live for the lord to be in the midst of the battle amen and you know what it doesn't always have to be that radical and extreme because just every day life taking a stand for Jesus and even admitting that we live for the Lord or taking a stand whenever somebody says, hey, man, you want to do a little something, something, whatever that something, something is. Mm -hmm. It's like, man, you know what? I used to, can, can we, can we be in agreement that, that it used to be that a little something, something made us feel good. But then after a while, that little something, something wasn't making us feel so good anymore, but instead it was causing pain in our life. And if we can agree on that, then at some point in time, we ought to be able with the grace of the Lord to say, no, man, you know what? I used to be there. I used to be there and I used to do that. And all it did was it left me empty and it left me full of pain. But guess what? I found a new way. I found Jesus. And this, you can do what you want with this, but Jesus changed me. And as long as I keep moving towards him, I feel his strength. I feel his power. And I know I'm heading in the right direction. So to be honest with you, dude, I don't want your little something, something. Ma'am, I don't want your little something, something. I want my Jesus. Amen. Lord, give us the grace that we need in order to take the stand. Hallelujah. Hebrews were with the Philistines at that time, which went up with them into the camp of the country round about. Even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. So my message this morning is a move towards victory. Let me just real quick, I just want to share a couple of things with you. You know, I've already said it a little bit, but isn't it nice whenever we see brothers and sisters in the Lord that appear to be strong, that appear to be moving in the right direction. The Apostle Paul told, wrote a letter to the Corinthians and he said this, he said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. If you could go to Ecclesiastes chapter four, verses nine through 12, this is another Old Testament passage. But in this passage of scripture of Ecclesiastes chapter four, it's talking about if a man is standing by himself. Uh huh. Verse uh, chapter four, verse nine through 12. It says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him that is alone when he falls for he doesn't have another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevails against them, in other words, if somebody comes against them and is, has, and is more powerful than him, two, if he has somebody with him, can withstand him. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. Many times people use this scripture to describe marriage, right? And a marriage that has where the husband and the wife are together and they have Jesus in the midst of the marriage, a three cord broken or a, a three a braided rope is not easily 
broken. Amen. And Jesus in the connection of our relationships uh, is what fuses and holds us together. But at the same time, you saw how the passage said, that's just Old Testament wisdom. It says two is better than one. If you got somebody that's with you, that's heading in the right direction with you, hallelujah, it helps to motivate you. It helps to give you strength. You can't turn around and start putting your trust in that person. No, your trust must remain in Jesus. But it's a good thing when we got people in the church, in the body of Christ that are heading in the right direction. You know, there's always times that we need help to get up and move in the right direction. Ultimately, our trust, once again, has to be focused on Jesus but it's important that we have brothers and sisters in the faith. Let me just talk to you a little bit about Jonathan. He's the main character of our story. At least that's what I see. And if you go back and you read further on than where we were in chapter 18, there's a scene where David, you, you know, y'all have all heard of David, right? King David. He was the greatest king Israel ever had. He's the one that killed the giant Goliath when he was a little boy. Just make sure we're all on the same on the same page. And and young and David had already been anointed king for several years, but he wasn't operating as king. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like God said, David is going to be my king, but Saul was still king. And in chapter 18, Jonathan realizes that David is going to be the next king. I need you to try to put yourself in Jonathan's shoes for a second. I need you to try to imagine that you have ownership of something. And then all of a sudden somebody comes up to you and tells you, oh no, you don't, this doesn't belong to you. You know, like in other words, you were born in a home, you were born in a family, and your father gave you something. A vehicle. And all of a sudden, somebody came up to you and said, hey, man, this vehicle doesn't really belong to you. It belongs to someone else. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, let's just say this. It belongs to the president. And he's now going to take your vehicle. That's basically what's going on. Why, why do I say it like that? Because Jonathan was Saul's son. Jonathan was the rightful heir to the throne. But Saul disregarded God's will. And so therefore, God took the throne away from Saul in order to give it to David. But it was always God's will to give it to David anyway, because really Saul was a type of the flesh because the people wanted something, but they didn't want to wait on God's timing. Be careful that you run out and get what it is that you want when you want it instead of waiting on the timing of God and God's will for your life. Because Saul caused nothing but frustration in the lives of the children of Israel. But Jonathan got a revelation from God. He, he got a revelation that, guess what? This throne doesn't belong to me. Oh, in the physical, I got every right to this throne because my daddy is the king. It was supposed to be mine. He didn't sit there and throw a temper tantrum and like a little two-year-old child, oh, they're taking my stuff that belongs to me. No, he didn't. He gained a revelation that this world and this life is bigger than me and that God's will for my life is that I humble myself. Yes, and he told David, he said, listen, he took off his mantle. The mantle was an outer garment that represented his authority. He took off his mantle and he gave it to David and he took his, his weaponry and he gave it to David in chapter 18. I'm just trying to give you a picture of this man named Jonathan and what his heart looked like and how he was willing to submit to God's will, even though it was not what was best for him personally or it did not seem to be what was best for him personally. Do you understand that God operates in a whole different realm in a whole different way than we do? You know, whenever I first got saved back in the 80s, I went back and visited some of my friends. This was kind of like the cliche of the time. I went back and I visited some of my friends. They were still in the drug world. And I was like, hey, man, what's been happening? Dude, oh, you know me, man. I ain't got no shame in my game. What, is, what does that even mean when I go back to that? Oh, so you're still ripping people off. So you're still crooked. So you're still dealing drugs on the street corner. So you're still jacking people. So you're still cutting the stuff. And you're doing them dirty. Oh, so that's cool, right? Oh, okay, you ain't got no shame in your game. Well, what you need to do is you need to get some shame in your game. And you need to humble yourself to the will of the Lord, amen. And you need to let Jesus change you. Because if you keep going down the same old path, you're going to keep ending up in the same old destination. And you don't like where you've been. Don't tell me you like where you've been. Because your flesh is leaving you empty. But Jonathan, man, he humbled himself. And he said, you know what? This doesn't belong to me. God said it belongs to David. I'm going to humble myself. And I, instead of living for myself, I'm going to learn to live for God. And I'm going to give it over to the Lord. Hallelujah. 
spiritually we are to humble ourselves and even stop fighting in our own strength. But in the actual story, man, I just can't get over this man's character. How many people do you know that would really give up out of their own pocket? I mean, you might know some, but they ain't a whole lot of them. Give up out of their own pocket to help somebody else. Knowing that there's maybe something that they want to do in the direction they want to go, but the Lord's telling them to go in another direction, and it hurts, and it's painful. But what do they do? They're like, I know, Lord, your will, so I'm going to go in your direction. Help us, Lord, to be like Jonathan. Amen. In the story, once again, the children of Israel are living in fear. They're hiding in dens and caves. They're stuck. Their leader is sitting under a, the shade of a tree. They're stuck in a rut. You know, every day that you and I stay stuck in a rut of defeat, we are allowing ourselves to begin to believe that this is normal Christianity. Come on, it's good. And I'm here to tell you that that's not normal Christianity. Each and every one of us have been there. Each and every one of us have been in a place of complacency where we're just sitting back and we're like, oh man, this is just how it's going to be. Oh, woe is me for the rest of my life. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna feel sorry for myself and I'm gonna be miserable. No, you ain't we ain't gotta be miserable. No, that's not normal Christianity to live in defeat, to be stuck in a rut, to be complacent, to be sitting back. No, that might be what everybody else is doing around us. That might be what the modern church says that there's no victory, so you gotta go see the psychologist. But I'm here to tell you today that victory is in Christ, hallelujah, and that if we'll believe him and follow after him, we will see victory in our lives. I'm believing that and I'm not yes. going to back off of it. Yes. Shortcomings, yes. Failures, yes. It's going to happen. But John 16, 33 says this. These things I have spoken to you. In this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. Frustrations, yes. Failures, yes. Going back sometimes in the wrong direction, yes, but not staying there. Not staying stuck in a run of defeat. No, stand up and to go towards the Lord. R Romans 8.37 says this. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen. See, but in order to walk in victory. In order to experience the truth of God's word in our lives. We will not be able to stay stuck in a rut of where we've been living in a place of spiritual paralysis. Jonathan got up and he moved in the direction of victory. No matter what the odds look like, whatever it is that you're facing in your personal life, in your personal situation, I'm here to tell you that no matter what the odds look like, no matter how impossible it seems, God is either able or he's not. And I'm here to tell you that he is. Amen. And I'm here to tell you that his word says that he is more than able to give us the victory. But will we believe him? All right. Here's some principles. In this story about victory and defeat. You ready? First one, resting on the right side. So, listen, the battle has to start in the right place. If you and I are going to win the victory in Christ, the battle has to start from the right place. All right? The way that you to fight, spiritually speaking, look at Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. If you could put that up there for me real quick. <coughs> The way God wants his people to fight is completely different than the way that you would think you're supposed to fight. You know, Troy and I, were, I think it was Troy and I were having a talk the other day. And the way my dad used to tell me, I don't think I ever did it the way he said. He's, he, he's, he would always say, when you're about to get in a fight, hit him first. As soon as you see him look at you cross-eyed and you know it's about to go down, just go ahead and clip him in the chin. Boy, that's the one you got to do. Just hit him first. Well, that's what the world would say how you win the fight. But what I'm trying to tell you is that what the Lord says is that you humble yourself. And you put the Lord in the battle. And that you fight from a place of rest. Believing that Jesus has already won the victory. You put him in the battle. See what it says? Come unto me. All you that labor and are heavy laden. You know what that describes? It describes that I'm walking around with a big old load on my back and I can't really keep my head up. Because I've been over here trying to struggle and fight in my own strength and in my own flesh. And I'm getting defeated spiritually. And he says, if you're coming to me, I'm going to give you rest. Look at the next scripture. It says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me for I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Jesus wants you and I to learn how to fight from a position of resting in Christ. That's the first rest on the right side. Now, listen, I want to share this with you. This is the, what did it say? It said that the children of Israel were in an area called Benjamin. 
You know what Benjamin means? It means the son of the right hand. Hallelujah. Look, I want you to see a couple of scriptures. Go to Romans 8, 34 real quick. I'm talking about the son of the right hand. Do you know who the son of the right hand is? Mm -hmm. Jesus. Hallelujah. Listen to me. Benjamin was the last child of Joseph and, and Rachel. And, and his name originally was ben Omai, which means in great pain I bore him. But Joseph changed his name to Benjamin, which means son of the right hand. So that's where the real Benjamin was first born in this tribe was named after him many years later. But I'm here to tell you the fulfillment of the son of the right hand is, is, is Jesus. Who is he that condemns? Who's going to call you guilty? It is Christ that died. Yes, rather is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God. Look at Ephesians 1.20. Ephesians 1.20 says, which he wrought or produced in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Look at Hebrews 1.3. We're talking about the son of the right hand. You know, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand. Of the majesty on high. You may not have realized this, but in the Old Testament, the right hand describes power. It describes power and authority. And I'm here to, and it describes God's power and authority. And I'm here to tell you that the battle for victory has to start in the right place. And the right place is that you be in spiritual Benjamin. It means that you be in Christ. It means that you put Jesus in the midst of the battle. It means that you come to the realization that you can't win the victory in your own strength. What is it that you have going on in your life that you can't win the victory? I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, you just need to give it to Jesus. You just need to say, hey, Lord, I know you're seated at the right hand of the Father and that you've already won the victory. I can't win it. I'm going to give it to you, Lord, and I need you to give me the grace that I need to be obedient to you. It's got to start in the right place. So the children of Israel were in Benjamin. Got to start in the right place. Son of the right hand. But the, the Philistines were in Michmash. What does Michmash mean? It means hidden. See, many times the reason that we don't move towards victory is because we've got hidden things in our life. You know, Angie and Naya did a great job Wednesday night when they preached on the wall of Jericho. What they did was they, wrote, they drew a wall up here, and they had individual bricks in the wall, and they got the children to come up even and start. And they said, you know what? Spiritual walls built in our lives are made up of individual bricks, and those individual bricks represent various things in our lives. Sin, lust, fear, anger, shame, Guilt, pride, all these various things. They build up walls on the inside of our hearts. They're the hidden things that, that, that prevent us from moving forward. They restrain us. Because many times those hidden things, the enemy uses them to produce shame in our hearts, guilt in our lives. But I'm here to tell you that that's not what the Word of God says. I'm here to tell you that Jesus died so that you and I could be free from that bondage. Jesus died, hallelujah, so that that guilt and condemnation could be lifted off of us. So that we could get up and walk in the right direction. That's what mikmash means. It means the hidden thing. I want you to see, can you turn to Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1? Sometimes people wonder, what shall I do? They say, let me tell the pastor. You know, sometimes I got, and listen, please call me if you need to talk. I mean that when I say it. But a lot of times people are like, man, I've got to tell the pastor about this. Or i got to tell my mama about this. Or i got to tell my friend about this. Look, no, you know who you need to talk to? You need to talk to Jesus. Amen. You need to talk to Jesus. That's one of the things that we try to teach people in this church is how to let Jesus be the pastor of your soul. Amen. Amen. But look what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Be seeing that we are compassed about or surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses. You know what that means? You're not the first one to have struggles as a Christian. You know what that means? You're not the first one that the, that the enemy has tried to make you quit. But they didn't quit. And so since you've been surrounded with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. And let us run with patience. Hallelujah. The race. 
that is set before us. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say that the hidden thing is going to try to make you stay stuck, living in fear, in the caves, in the dens, and not getting up like Jonathan and moving towards victory, believing that the Lord has given you the victory in the battle. That's the first thing. Listen, you got to fight from the right position. Son of the right hand. Trust in Christ. Put him in the battle. Number two, by the grace of God, let us give the hidden thing to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Number three. You ready? The door of direction. I told you about that rock where they walked through. They were on the move, right? They were going towards the battle. They were going to go win the victory. Stay with me. I promise you I'm about to close. I can tell I'm getting a little too long-winded. Y'all hang in there. We're almost there. Every single time that you move towards victory in the battle, there's going to be a passageway and there's going to be a choice. You're either going to have to go to the left or you're going to go to the right. One of those rocks named was Bozes. Can you go to Matthew 17? In Matthew 17, verses 1 through 8, it describes the Lord being transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. Y'all remember that story? I don't even know that we have to read it. I'm just going to tell you about it. What happened? The Lord's glory that was on the inside of him, his, all of his clothing turned white. He became so white, his clothing was white, he radiated, glory came off of him. It was surpassing, it was shining, the glory of the Lord was revealed. That's what one of those rocks was named. It was named white, surpassing white, glistening. Listen to me, when you walk through that passage on your way to victory, it's going to be one of two places that you're going to turn. You're either going to turn towards the glory of the Lord and in his direction, the other rock was called thorny. Listen to me, Genesis chapter 3, whenever mankind fell, the earth grew thorns and thistles. Thorns are a type of the fall. That's why Jesus had a, a crown of thorns thrust upon his head. It was descriptive of the curse that has taken place on the earth. Every single time that you desire to move towards victory, you're going to be faced with a situation. Yeah. You're going to have to go either to the right or to the left. You're going to have to either go towards the glory of the Lord in his direction, or you're going to make a choice to go towards fallen man. Listen, Yvette, could you come up and play us a song? Every Christian battle that we face has a crossroad that requires a decision. Which way will we go? One direction leads towards Jesus in the direction of God's will, and the other leads towards the, the really the path that most of mankind travels. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, he said that straight is the way, narrow is the gate that leads unto life. And there's going to be a few that find that way. The majority of people are not going down the straight and narrow path. The majority of people are not turning towards the Lord. The majority of people are following the course of the world. Lord, help us to not be those people that would follow the course of the world. I just want... I want Yvette to play us a song. And as we worship the Lord together, if you're going through something that you need prayer for, I just want you to know that the altars are open. Amen.